you will, open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse 1 and read uh, those first seven verses in Acts chapter 6. I suspect if you were to survey uh, the unbelieving world, uh, they might say of the Bible that it is uh, boring or irrelevant or uh, maybe many other types of uh, criticisms uh, that they might level toward the Bible. I have a greater fear that we in the church might too often say something similar in that uh, we take the attitude of as we come to the Word of God daily, as we should, that we look at it as a duty versus a delight, that it is a, a mundane obligation. But if you would step back and get over your familiarity with the Bible, you would realize that it is a, a dynamic book. It is full of absolutely fascinating characters, uh, intriguing uh, drama, compelling uh, stories, all for the purpose of revealing our Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, to us. Now, with all of that being said, we come to this portion of the book of Acts. Again, a, an exciting, a compelling narrative full of great characters and drama and bold proclamation of the gospel. And we do a little housekeeping. We get another glimpse into the life of the church. It's how they put uh, certain issues in order for the good of the membership of that church. Certainly something that would seem relatively normative and fairly mundane. But I would suggest it's uh, worthy of our attention today that it is instructive both to the particular issue that is raised here but also as a, a matter of deriving principles by which we may uh, enter into and resolve difficulties and conflicts today uh, that maybe are completely unrelated to the issue at hand in Acts uh, chapter 6. And so while uh, no giants are slayed, no prison doors are broken open, not even a great sermon in it. We still see here that the power of God's Holy Spirit is given wisdom to the church uh, for, again, their own good and for the sake of the gospel going forth. So I think we would do well today to look at this business of these seven that God uh, through His apostles and through the church, set apart for a very unique service to that church in view, with a view towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's read. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenist arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Pray with me, if you would. Father, once again, uh, we thank you for your word. It is the testimony given to us for our good. It is a testimony given about your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us in saving us by entering into this realm, by taking 
on human flesh, taking on our sin and dying to overcome our guilt before you. And God, we thank you for that salvation and we thank you for that Savior. May he be exalted uh, today. May our understanding of what we have as instructions here today, may it allow us to have greater clarity and greater focus and, 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 and a greater commitment uh, to spreading your gospel. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've noted a couple of times as we have worked our way up to this point in the book of Acts that we see uh, that uh, Satan is opposing the church, that he is uh, working from the outside in. In other words, he is uh, uh, bringing uh, outsiders uh, and their evil to bear against the church. And then he's actually infiltrating uh, the church to uh, corrupt uh, the church. And, and here, uh, while I'm not going to make a, a really big deal of, about this, uh, a, a third strategy is not only to, to infiltrate this church, but to distract it, uh, but, but to, to cause uh, divisions, uh, to, to cause uh, dissension uh, among uh, the brethren. And I, I'll just tell you, uh, as a pastor now that's been doing this uh, for a quarter of a century, that one of the things that, that drains my energy, and, and as much as uh, I, I often enter into what is really serious suffering with the people of God, and, and that is certainly something that I am called to do and feel like I'm equipped to do, but when I see people griping and grumbling about things, it absolutely sucks the life out of me. And Now, again, it's one thing to deal with things that are incredibly important, and we do, uh, but to, to deal with secondary issues. But here we see in the text, and they, and they were dealing with things that were important. I mean, uh, people that were hungry, getting food is an important matter, is it not? But, but we see principles put in place that assist us and, and let us know that every problem is an opportunity for the glory of God to shine, for, for the grace of God, for the gospel of Jesus Christ to triumph over anything that divides or brings dissension uh, to us. And so we see uh, great wisdom here on the part of the uh, apostles and, and even... Uh, uh, exercised by the church uh, itself. Uh, God's working in them through the Holy Spirit to, to bring a, a sense of agreement and even uh, a sense of an efficiency to the church for the sake of the effectiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, it was important to, to resolve this matter of ministering to the widows. That was, was very, very important. I'm, I do not discount it. But of greater importance was to, to meet this need so that the church could be focused on that which was primary, namely seeing that the gospel was continued to be proclaimed to Jerusalem. And as we're about to see, it's going to springboard from Jerusalem into this known uh, world. And so we come here, and, and you notice there in chapter 6 and verse 1, I think in most translations, the first word is now. Again, a, a conjunction that, that transitions us from the last portion of, of chapter 5, uh, flowing out of this account of the persecution of those apostles and them being placed in jail and miraculously delivered, but undeterred. Uh, they continued to preach the gospel, and God blessed it, and the church was growing. And so while all of that was going on, God was at work, miracles were taking place, the gospel was being proclaimed, and people were saved. This particularly difficult, even precarious situation arose uh, within the church. Luke tells us that, that the church was growing. It was increasing in number. Again, the gospel was being proclaimed. Uh, there, was, there was doctrinal precision. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, as we were told back in Acts 2.42. The Spirit was at work that people were being converted. 
But yet, a problem is going to come up. It is a legitimate problem. Now, now, please hear me. Please hear me. Even, I hate to say illegitimate problems, but so take that term in quotation and advisedly. If they're brought up, they are brought up by legitimate people. Okay? Sometimes people create problems and sometimes they, they, they kind of look for problems. But even if the problem is something, maybe it's not the big deal you're thinking about, the people themselves are what? They're big deals. They are important. They are necessary. They are essential for uh, the life of the church. And so in the midst of this growth, of this excitement, this dynamic leadership, the church is growing. And any church that grows experiences what we call what? Growing pains. That, that there's always uh, tensions between uh, the old and new, between uh, what should change and what should remain the same. All of these things are normative uh, dynamics. Uh, as the church uh, increases in its diversity. Now, I'm, I, I'll tell you this. All churches would be better off if everybody was like me. But unfortunately for you and for me, not everybody can be like me. And I, I accept you. For not being like me, okay? Come on now, that was that was at least reasonably funny. God, okay. But what we love to see is diversity. I see multiple shades of hair and skin tones on top of people's heads too. But but multiple shades of of hair and and. Differing ages and differing genders and differing races. And that's good. We want to see all people come under the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved and be united and even celebrate that diversity even in the midst of the unity of our confession of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Again, that, that's a challenge that we accept. In, in the midst of growth, there's a, a fertile ground for misunderstanding, whether it's a failure to meet expectations or somebody's needs to be uh, actually neglected. We would desire to see the gospel powerful and effective and Christ confessed as Lord. And so this particular problem is to find as a complaint by the Hellenist against the Hebrews there within the church. Again, uh, both believers uh, here in the church, a conflict among believers. Specifically, the widows were being neglected. Now, as I think I mentioned previously, the church rightly inherited, both in terms of tradition and law, a concern for the widow. And I would even expand it to, to anyone uh, that is in need. That the church should have uh, an, a, an expressed or confessed interest and then a, a practical way, a practical plan uh, for meeting that. But here already in, in the midst of the church, and evidently this explosive church in which, you know, there may have been somewhere in the neighborhood of five up to maybe even 20, 25,000 people that were a part of this church that was meeting there uh, on the temple grounds there in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And so there's ample room for all types of confusion and all types of, of troubles. And so as money and resources was pooled, and we've seen already uh, that people were even willing to sell property and give it uh, to the church, and, and it, the money was used to, evidently to buy food that was distributed. And here we see two different groups of people. Both sh supposedly share in the Lord Jesus Christ. But culturally speaking, there were things that were distinctive about them. Now notice the term here. You may not be familiar uh, with this term Hellenist. And even the commentators sometimes uh, will say, well, that's hard to know exactly what the issue was. But typically... When you see the term Hellenist or Hellenization, it refers to the Greek influence, uh, particularly upon that Mediterranean basin, 
that was uh, a direct result of the conquest of one known as Alexander the Great that took place in the 4th century uh, B.C. Most of you probably from uh, your middle school year uh, history uh, know something of the son of Philip of Macedon, Alexander the Great, one of the great king warriors of the ancient world uh, from the region of northern Greece that conquered uh, all of the known world. Uh, after uh, Babylon had been defeated by the Persians, the Greeks came in and defeated uh, those Persians and they came to dominate the world and what they left behind when they were subsequently defeated by the Romans was Greek philosophy uh, and most particularly this Greek language uh, of which the New Testament uh, was written and seemed to be kind of the, the business language of the Mediterranean people. And so you'll often hear that when Jesus came into the realm uh, uh, in the, you know, whatever it was, A.D. or, or B, uh, 4 B.C., and um, came to the forefront, 27 A.D., that one of the things that made possible uh, his ministry and the subsequent growth of the church, the preaching of the, of the uh, disciples, was the Roman roads and the Roman peace. And that certainly was a part of what allowed the gospel to go forth. But make no mistake about it, before there were Roman roads and Roman peace, there was a Greek language that allowed the gospel to be widely communicated. And so not only did they, um, the people of the Mediterranean basin uh, speak Greek, they became uh, very Greek-oriented. Even the Jews, which we know, and if you know Jews, they have resisted in many ways uh, allowing their own culture to... To, to be lost in the midst of whatever culture they're, they're living in, okay? Uh, you can usually very readily identify even the most nominal of uh, Jews by certain uh, distinctives. But yet, these Jews, uh, who probably had moved out from Jerusalem, had begun to speak Greek and had adopted customs, and quite honestly, there was a bit of prejudice against them. They, they were considered as uh, a bit of second-class citizens. Certainly the Pharisees would have thought them of uh, uh, lesser uh, quality, lesser good, lesser value uh, than others. Now what we don't know, were they neglected because of some intentional oversight within the church? Well, we just don't want to deal with these Greek speakers. Uh, was it because, well, they just got kind of lost in all of the momentum and maybe they didn't know what time to show up to get to get food. We don't know. We, we, don't, we don't know all of, all of the details. What we know is there was a problem and there were those that, that called the problem uh, to the attention of the church and to the attention uh, of these apostles. And there's nothing unreasonable about their complaint. And as we uh, saw in our text that we read uh, this morning, the Apostle Paul gave great attention and great detail and specific instructions about how uh, the church for all places at all times, or to have a high regard and a particular way of, of caring uh, for uh, those uh, who are uh, widowed. And so uh, in this difficult situation, we will see uh, that, again, God is going to work uh, to bring about good, to bring about resolution, uh, to bring about a, a unity uh, for the sake of the gospel going forward. Now, you know, again, having done this for a while, uh, sometimes uh, uh, people approach me, and I'm very much in that, okay, I know. I, I know I'm getting, fixing to get punched right in the nose. I know something's wrong. I know something. I know you're upset, and so forth and so on. And, you know, you just kind of, okay, you know, I'm going to rope a dope here. Google it. I know my, all, all my illustrations are way out of date, okay? But, but you can Google rope a dope, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. But, um, we need to see many times, even I would say all the time, since God works in all things for the good of those who love Him, that in every problem we should be working toward a solution that honors God, that, that again, is, that utilizes uh, biblical principles. And here's the thing, and I mentioned this, there, there may be problems that really aren't the problems that people think they are, but we need to be attentive to every problem because every single person in the church matters. Okay, had a very good friend that uh, 
served on the deacon board at Somerville First Baptist with me. He was president of the local bank. And he was a pretty hard-bitten guy. I, I used to do business with him. I thought, I'll grab your tie, I'll drag you across this desk, and I'll stomp you right here in this office. If you, you know, uh, bankers and business people, it's, it's uh, not always the most pleasant of circumstances that you deal with. But I grew to love the guy. And he ran just a great bank. I could tell you a lot of stories. But he said, you know, one thing I tell my bankers, if you can devalue one customer, you can devalue them all. And I believe that's true. I believe that's applicable to the church. If I can just look at any one of you, or you look at me and go, well, that's just Tim. Well, that's just so-and-so. You know, who cares what they think? Well, you can just start applying that to everybody. It gets, really, it gets much easier. Well, I don't care what you think. You think, you think, you th Just go on and on and on. Okay? And so we need to be, obviously, very attentive when complaints come our way. They're difficult, but also they're an opportunity for us to grow. But notice here, these disciples were wise enough, they were under the influence, they were filled with God's Holy Spirit, and they, they realized that we're not going to let this issue distract us from what God has called us to do, from what God has commissioned us to do, from what God has uh, commanded us to do. And you, you see there, verse, verse 2, they state very clearly, it's not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God to serve tables. They didn't say it. Now listen, it doesn't matter. Tell them to suck it up. Tell them to get up earlier and get in line first next time. No, they said, listen... Let, let's, 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 put, let's, gri let's drive one stake in the ground, so to speak. And the stake is we're not going to neglect this business that God has charged us uniquely with. We're not going to give up preaching the Word for this issue. Okay, And so they, they made a, a very important statement of thy, their priority. Their statement didn't say it doesn't matter. They just said, we're going to, whatever we do, whatever the resolution that we come up with, there's going to be a priority upon the Word of God. Now, there's a lot of discussion. And for several years, I used to say, well, this is where our deacons come from. And I'm not quite as quick to say that because they, that really doesn't necessarily uh, identify them. There's, there's the language, there's the, 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 the form of the word diakonos that we see in there, but it really doesn't. Probably the office, the title was developed a little bit later, but I think it informs us. And I think it informs us not only about deacons, but it informs us a bit about pastors. And I want to be very clear. This, very, this is important. There are no more apostles, therefore I am not an apostle, and there are no apostles in this church, okay? And there's no apostles in any church, for that matter. As I've told you before, if you go to a church and apostle so-and-so steps up, you always tell me, you know, when, they show, when the snakes come out, y'all are going out the back door. Well, when Apostle John steps up, you need to go out the back door more quickly than you would when the snakes show up, okay? So they're more dangerous. There are no more apostles. But I think as this informs us a bit about deacons, I think it informs us a bit about elders, pastors, bishops, about the priority. And I believe that we have inherited, if you study uh, the charges made and the descriptions of those who would lead in the church, the elders, the pastors, we find them primarily charged with leading the church through the ministry of uh, the Word, that we are to care, that we are to shepherd with the Word of God, that the elder, as Paul would write in 1 Timothy 3, 2, to, or is to be able to teach, and as he charged Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, we are to preach the Word, and when Paul charged Titus to appoint the elders that, that these elders must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught and be able to give instruction. And so I believe that I can say that it is right for pastors to be devoted to this business of preaching uh, the word. But again, they made that statement, but what did they do? We all go home, work it out on yourself, and let me know what you do. No. Let's look at the reasonable solution. There, beginning in verse, uh, verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. Now, evidently they go to the congregation, to the church, and say, here's what we want you to do. We're giving to you an assignment. We're giving to you certain uh, authority, empowerment. We want you to make a discerning choice as to men 
who would be worthy of tackling, who would be responsible for tackling this duty, who would be faithful in dismissing. We live in a world where the church or the secular world, world there are too many people that want a title, uh, that, 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 that want to not have, a, have a, a, a role, but they don't want to be responsible to the duties. Okay? And so in the church, we should recognize those who are already discharging the duties before we place upon them any formal title. It's a good way of kind of working this thing in the church. And so they picked out these men, and I'll make no apology. Uh, I, I understand the sensitivity of our day. Uh, but uh, the Bible is very clear uh, that it is men that God has assigned the responsibility of leadership uh, within uh, his, his church. And so uh, pick these men, and, and given these particular qualifications, notice there, uh, beginning in uh, verse 3, they're to be of good repute. That is, they are to have a reputation uh, among both the church and those outside the church. Uh, for integrity, for uh, being trustworthy. Uh, they are full of the Spirit. They're, they're men. Now, we'll see two particular uh, of these, out of, two, two out of the seven have a bit of a starring role in the chapters that will follow here in the book of Acts. And it is interesting, they seem well-versed in terms of the Word of God. And I will say this to you. There is no possibility, there is no chance of being filled with the Spirit of God if you're not first filled with the Word of God. If, if you do not have a diligence toward the study of the Word of God, I will tell you right now, now I don't care how much you swing and sway with the music, I don't care if you flip and flop in the back aisle uh, there when Drew gets up here and sings, or whatever you do, you're not filled with the Spirit. If you're not filled with the Word of God. So what does this tell me? If they were full of the Spirit, what else were they full of? They are full of the Word. And we see them, what, starring in the proclamation of the Word within a matter of a few verses. So, good repute, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom. Again, impossible to be full of the Spirit, full of the Word, without what? Having wisdom. The ability to take knowledge and apply it even in difficult situations. Again, we can see the apostles already doing what? They're men filled with the Spirit, knowledgeable of the Scriptures, and they're bringing their wisdom to bear upon a, a delicate, a divisive. Uh, and, and I would say even an essential situation that, that must, it had to be resolved. They couldn't just say, we're not, hey, <sighs> women. They, no, no. We're going to resolve. They've got a legitimate issue. And we're going to deal with it legitimately, okay? And so, pick them. Here are the characteristics that we would desire. So the church would bring them to them, and evidently they kind of have the, the, the right of refusal, then we will appoint them. That we, we will recognize them. We, we will probably have some type of examination period. We'll, we'll interview them. We'll talk to them. And then we shall recognize. We'll bring them uh, before uh, the church so that uh, they can be recognized. And this seemed to work. Everybody seemed happy. We have a resolution to what is a legitimate problem. And then they, they list the seven men. And I've already uh, mentioned that the only two that we really know very much about uh, is Stephen and Philip. We'll see them later and uh, uh, see their proclamation of the truth. Uh, there's a, some church traditions, I'm not going to get into it, that say some things about the others. I will f say, kind of by a manner of just kind of interesting, uh, the third one listed, uh, Prochorus, uh, some believe that he became associated with the Apostle John and may have functioned for him as a scribe or, or secretary in the writing of his uh, gospels and epistles. We don't know that, but just an, an interesting uh, thought. And so uh, what did they do? Uh, they selected the men, they brought them to the disciples, and in verse 6, they, they set them uh, before the apostles, and they prayed and they, la they laid hands on them. Again, a very important thing that, that recognizes a, a sense of 
unity and continuity, uh, approval, uh, probably even going back to uh, the anointing of, of, of kings and things like that. We still do it uh, when we uh, recognize those that have been called to be pastors or elders or call, called to be uh, deacons in the church. I think it's a very beautiful, very ancient sign. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily anything mystical about it. But it very easily could be identified as a means of grace. When a, when a man comes to be recognized and realizes he has the support of the church and the men of the church come in uh, to pray and to speak and to encourage, that that certainly is a, a means by which God's grace is experienced uh, by all that are involved. Okay, so they come up with a, a particular way of, of solving the problem. It seems to uh, be a workable solution, a practical solution, uh, something that, that indeed uh, would please the entirety of the congregation. And so let's go back to this business of the crucial distinction. And back again to verse 2. They made clear their particular uh, commitment about their priorities. Many times people will hear me say, no matter what happens throughout the week, I must step up here on Sunday and I must preach the Word and I can't fake it. Uh, you know, there's, there's no just mailing it in, okay? You, you have to be prepared. You have to devote yourself uh, to study. And that, that takes time and it takes effort and it takes energy. And folks, let me, let me assure you this. It's a blessing. There, there, is, there is absolutely no complaint from me, okay? Y'all bless me by allowing me to do this, okay? Let me be just really, really clear about that. And, and so the, the disciples weren't saying, Now, we are apostles, and you are just lowly church members, and you lowly church members must allow us High and mighty apostles to sit in our ivory towers. No. He said, again, we have a commitment. We have a responsibility. We know to what we will give an account before God for. Okay? And we're going to allow you to designate and recognize men who can serve and bless the church and, and bless these widows who, who are in need okay one of the blessings that i experienced on my last trip to tanzania was something that uh, rejoice and that church does is have a weekend widows conference and i i don't know they probably had i don't know 200 widows that that showed up and remember there's not a lot in the way of a, a social uh, net to capture uh, those that are in need in, in a nation like Tanzania here, you know, there's various things that the government does, whether it's right or wrong, that's debatable, but hopefully it's an assistance at some level for those who, who have need. And the church has unfortunately stepped back far too often and let the government discharge what the church should have been involved with from the very beginning. But at any rate, in Tanzania, they, they do this ministry and one of the big things they do is give them a huge sack of flour uh, or meal to, to take home to make bread. And there was one particular lady who had been widowed at a, a relatively young age. I mean, you know, she was probably in her 30s, maybe 40s. You know, that's pretty young now to me. And uh, her own children had come in and taken all their possessions after their father had died. She was left with nothing. That, that's the way it works in Tanzania that the, the wife gets nothing. And so they just came and took everything, and she was left destitute. And so uh, that church had a great testimony in that community because they did what? They ministered uh, to those uh, in, in need. They, they, they addressed very real concerns, and that's always been a factor in uh, the New Testament church. And so... For those that are serving as pastors or elders, there's always a challenge of being very disciplined and very organized and single-minded, devoted to the Word of God, but being available. One of the things that has informed my pastorate, before I was uh, ordained, 
when I was still in my hometown of Somerville, I was a deacon and uh, a business person and traveled out of town every day. I was very busy. Uh, left Somerville usually around 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, drove to Fort Payne, Anniston, and Gadsden. Got back home at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. I had some need of speaking to our pastor at that time. Uh, before I left, I was a deacon. I wasn't a squeaky wheel. I wasn't somebody that just had to you know, get the pastor's ear. And I went by the church office and said, Hey, can I see the pastor for just a minute? He said, No, he's studying. He doesn't allow anybody to interrupt his study. Okay. Okay. Now, again, there was not another time for me to see this gentleman. And I, again... You've got to be organized. You've got to be disciplined. You, you've got to say no to things. And you've got to, got to button it down and get in there and study. But you better be available to your people too. You better be available to actually shepherd your people when the crisis comes, when the difficulty comes. And it, sometimes it's hard to figure it out. But I, not long after that particular incident, and I'm not a John Maxwell fan. If y'all don't know who he is, go look him up. But I never will forget uh, a, a talk or something gave five things I know about people and there was one principle that's always stuck in my mind and that is nobody cares how much you know till they know how much you care and I believe that I believe now listen I could be the biggest jerk in the world and I know some of you probably at times think I am the biggest jerk in the world and the 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 word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword no matter how bad a person I am okay and I believe that but I do not want to discredit and dishonor the Word of God or the God of the Word by my behavior, okay? And so we want to live out. We want to be as incarnate as we possibly can the great truth of serving the people of God. And so they were devoted to the Word and they were devoted to prayer, to interceding for their people, to making petition for their people. Just, I mean, in the last 24 hours, I was made aware of one death and five sicknesses in this congregation. You know, did, I didn't, didn't, didn't know. Had to fuss at some people for not letting me know what's going on here. What's the deal? But I'm kidding. I never fuss at anybody. I told a friend yesterday, I said, I'm not a real critical person. He looked at me and said, have you lost your mind? Do you ever listen to yourself? But anyway. Devoted to prayer. Devoted to going before God on behalf of the people entrusted to your care. And how, how do you rightly intercede? And again, I, I think there's value. God bless these wonderful people you've entrusted me with. But I think there's also value. I know that Jeff is going through this. I know that Joey is going through this. I know that Heath is going through this. Would you act? Would you? And on and on it goes. That And I don't know of anything real big y'all are going through right now. That, that was just illustrative, okay? But, but to know your people and know specifically how to pray for them is a vital important. And so they were devoted. And, and here's the interesting thing there in, in verse uh, 4. Uh, they will uh, devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry. And that word ministry is that same kind of common word, diakonos, Okay? It, it, it's, they're, they're servants of the Word, okay? And the Word does not serve my agenda, okay? The Word is not for me to utilize just to put you down. The Word, I am under the authority of the Word of God. I am under the authority of the God who gave us this Word. I serve underneath the Word, not over the Word, okay? And so we minister in that fact, in that way. And so the Word of God is our priority. Well, why? I've done this many, many times in many ways, but let me just quickly. We're ministers of the Word. We make the Word a priority because the Word is the law and the gospel. One of the things years ago I discovered from a ministry called the White Horse Inn, those were the first Christian yahoos that I ran across. And those guys are wild. They've gotten old now. They're not as wild as they used to be. But they, made, they were very clear and articulate about Martin Luther's emphasis upon the law and the gospel and holding them in, in the proper distinctive and putting them in their proper role. Spurgeon discovered this as well. But it is the law 
that so works in us that produces guilt and condemnation so that we will do what? Just wring our hands and do nothing and just say, well, I'm going to just try harder tomorrow. No. It is the law that drives us to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I think Spurgeon called it the silver needle that draws the golden thread of the gospel. And so we preach the law and gospel. We seek to rightly divide it. The, the Word is this testimony uh, to and of Christ. It is of, from the Word that we see these great confessions of the, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is the Word made flesh. He is grace and truth who has lived among us. He is the, the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of His nature. He is the one in whom the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He is the Creator, and He is the Redeemer. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Those are great confessions that we find in the Scriptures to who Jesus is. So we rightly emphasize that. And then, in a, in a way, and I, well, this is one of my favorite concepts. It really is. Jeff and I were just talking about the new birth, regeneration. And because I'm so good at this, and I'm so wise and so powerful and persuasive, I can cause the new birth. Did you know that? I'm being facetious and sarcastic. I cannot cause the new birth. But folks... This right here, taken by the Spirit of God, is the imperishable seed of the new birth. That's why we emphasize that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God because this is the imperishable seed of the new birth. And that's what we desire, to see people born again. And so we preach the Word because it's indeed necessary that we would flourish in this life and in the next. Why we emphasize so many times... You need to cultivate a biblical worldview. If you don't think biblically about a subject, you're sinning. If, you, if, if, if the Bible informs how you should think about something, you're not entitled to another view. I'm sorry. Okay? You know, that's just the way it is. And so the church was in agreement. They, they had a conflict. It was real. It, it was important. It, it, it involved people that were important. It, it, it involved a ministry that was important to the church. All these things were priorities. They set certain priorities that we're not going to negotiate on, and now we're going to solve the problem, and we're in agreement. And so the, from the conflict, God worked to, to help them understand how to work together even in the midst of conflict, and then reminded them of what? That we're one in the Lord Jesus Christ. They would go forward, as Paul would write in Philippians 1, as, as one man contending for the faith, that they would deal with factions, as they come up, remember one of Paul's problems in Corinth. Hey, I hear that you know, there are divisions among you, and that's not good. You need, you need, we need to work. We need to resolve those things. And pastors are always working to instruct God's people so they, they would grow towards an increasing unity of the faith, Ephesians chapter 4. Well, having said and, and done all of these things, we see the final thing this morning there in verse 7. The pleasing evaluation, and Luke is very fond of, on occasion, giving us this snapshot, and it's kind of the thumbs up. Things, things are, are, are God's at work in the church. Uh, leadership is leading. Uh, uh, the the word of God is being proclaimed. God's people are are flourishing, and and so we're told. And it's an interesting way of saying it. And the word of God continued to increase. Uh, I, I like that. That, that, that they kept making a big deal about the Word of God. And that's why the church was increasing. Okay? That, that is, that's why we make a big deal about the Word of God. Is that, so that the church will increase, whether it's numerically, which we would love and we desire, or whether it's just simply the growing of the individual, in their, in, growing into grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think John MacArthur has said, you know, uh, God is in charge of the breadth of my ministry. And I'll give myself to the depth of my ministry. Again, pouring deeply into the lives that God would choose to entrust uh, to this congregation. So the Word of God continued to, to increase. The church continued to grow. The, the disciples were multiplying, okay? A healthy disciple multiplies. He replicates even to the place here. And I think this was, <laughs> he may have been set in stage, just a little foreshadowing there. Okay, priests were getting saved. And there's going to be a group of folks that are not going to be happy about that. Okay? 
And so Satan will once again continue his assault. And so we see that they began with a problem. They worked the problem. I, I love the, the movie Apollo 13. It's one of my favorite, favorite movies. And, you know, one of the things that, that uh, they say they're in mission control when, when the explosion happens in, in the space capsule is work the problem, people. Work the problem. And so we want to work the problem. We want to work the problem God's way. We want to look at it. God's way. We want to have knowledge and wisdom. We want to be full of the Spirit of God so we can be uh, discerning where, where, you know, sometimes uh, things that may be aggravating to us. No, now, okay, I know I'm the only person here who gets aggravated, right? Correct? Nobody else gets a little chapped every once in a while. Why are y'all not looking at me? Why is nobody making eye contact with me now? But even things that aggravate, behind it is a person that matters. A person for whom Jesus Christ died. One of the projects that, that I began this week, and, and I've kind of challenged the deacons, and there's no reason everybody here can't be involved with it. But as I've said many times, y'all know who's not here. They're your friends. And we need to be calling them. Not chewing them out. That's for me. No, I'm not going to. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I miss you. You've got a place. And you need to be here. And so, again, they resolved the problem. There is a, a, a relationship between efficiency and effectiveness. We don't want to waste anything. We don't, want to, we, don't, we don't want to waste manpower. We don't want to waste financial resources. We want to. I, I, I got on somebody the other day because I, I walked through a room and the thermostat's on 67. Now, it makes me think back to the days when I used to coach soccer, and people accused me of throwing clipboards and sun visors. I, I don't think I ever did that. You can ask Katie. I don't think I ever did it. But it just made me want to stomp. Why would we waste a nickel giving to Alabama Power something we might could use for something else? So we want to be efficient. And, and, we see here that I believe God is honored when those that are estranged are reconciled. So, so you know, the apostles could have said, listen, we ain't got time to fool this. You widows aren't happy. Y'all can hit the bricks. Right? No. We're going to take time. We're going to give serious attention to it. And we're going to work it out. We're going to figure a way to make this where the appropriate thing is being addressed. And that's for the good of the church and for the good of the watching world. Believe it or not, they are watching us. Okay? And every, every, every time you know, we get mad and we got to go here and we got to go there, the world's watching. They're taking notes. Okay? They're taking notes. It tells us a little bit about equipping the saints. Paul, uh, Paul in Ephesians 4, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. That doesn't mean, that, again, that I can sit in my ivory tower. But, again empowering all of us to play a role that is crucial. And I keep saying this, every member here, you have an important function to play here. It is essential that you play it. But here, and this, this gets specifically at this issue, and I, 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 it kind of hit me this week. The gospel is portrayed in our care for these widows and others that are in need. Uh, when we serve them, and I was reminded of how Paul describes Jesus. As even though he was eternally God and eternally glorious as God, he humbled himself, taking the form of a servant. And so how do we communicate to one another and to a watching world the realities of the gospel? How can we do it even more effectively and in a more beneficial way? By taking this form of a servant. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us, for your truth. God, I suppose in some ways maybe a text such as this isn't exciting or glamorous. Maybe you know, that we don't see great speeches. We don't, we don't see great courage being displayed. But Lord, we see a wisdom. We see a, 
a, a, a discerning attitude toward uh, problems and issues and, and people that I believe is still important to your church today. And so, Lord, may we be uh, well informed and may we be fully empowered uh, to serve as your servants within the church and even uh, within and to a watching world. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.